Well, welcome to the Maryland Native Plant Society's webinar on flora and fauna of the Patuxent Refuge and Beltsville Agricultural Research Center with Sam Drogi, who will speak to us about the looming threat from the maglev plant. Sam Drogi is a wildlife biologist who has spent 40 years at the USGS Patuxent Wildlife Research Center where he has developed and coordinated many monitoring programs to monitor amphibian, insect, bird, and other populations, and where he has also developed many citizen science projects. He received his BA from the University of Maryland in 1980 and his MS from State University of New York at Syracuse in 1985. And now, Sam, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Anne, and thanks, Lynn, for and the uh, Society for hosting this. So, uh, yes, I've been here for at, on Patuxent for 40 years, and I just want to say that I'm representing myself today, not the uh, research center. I work for U.S. Geological Survey. I also was born in D.C. and grew up in the Maryland suburbs, and spent time even as a young person. Um, Maryland Ornithological Society on Patuxent and uh, have worked both on the Ag Center and on Patuxent and know these areas well as where well as the surrounding areas. So I'm going to share my screen now so we can get to the talk. Okay, so um, here's a shot of an aerial of Patuxent Wildlife Research Center, Ag Center region, and um, uh, somewhat facetiously, I'm talking about the positive impacts of uh, the Maglev project. Um, and um, if I can get, oops, well, for some reason I am not up. Oh, there we go. And the, the answer is there are none. There is not one stitch of a positive impact or a positive um, event. There are only negative ones about the Maglev project. Um, for those of you who don't already know, a, the Maglev is a high-speed train that is um, currently slated to go between Washington and Baltimore with um, ambitions to go to New York and perhaps beyond. Um, this is their trial run, so to speak. Um, so the uh, Maglev project, though, um, has to have a place to um, run its um, train yards, its repair stations, its uh, manufacturing plants, its wash stations and um, just store trains. And that's going to be right now in one of three places, you'll see this later, um, all on public lands. We'll talk about that a lot. Um, what you're looking at it, at this picture, this is a picture of a Chinese, um, basically essentially high-speed train rail yard. This yeah, rail yard that you see here, and you'll see a couple other shots, is smaller than the one that will be taking up public land and as you can see, nothing is alive, except for maybe the people that are um, transporting those trains. If we look at the region around these um, federal properties that where the site is proposed, it's, um, there is still lots of biology. We have lots of parks, we have our favorite places. There are residual areas, but it leaks out biodiversity, right? It's kind of a one way ratchet. It's there now over time though, all the rarity, a lot of the rarity and things, it's hard to hold on because there's not an ebb and flow. We've dissected it far too much. So that's what's surrounding the area. If we look here, and I think you can see my cursor, what we're looking at is the largest area between Washington and Philadelphia that could be somehow seen as a well-connected, supportive landscape um, of forest and lots and lots of other kinds of habitats, some of which we'll touch on today, that supports biodiversity and still retains almost all of it. Um, some things have left, but almost everything is there. And the ones that have left may just simply be not found. Did I want to say anything else there? No, I have lots to cover. So the thing about the maglev train is this is where they want to put an essentially an industrial site. This is one of the streams of many that will be highly impacted. Most of these streams are headwater streams, um, part and parcel of the um, Anacostia and the Patuxent River uh, systems that contain a lot of the biodiversity and then downstream from these impact sites, you're gonna get nothing but uh, more siltation 
and more problems and pollution and runoff from these large industrial sites. So they have chosen public lands and um, for the public good to support a um, corporate private industrial site. So that's something we'll talk about in a little bit too. Um, why these lands? Well, it's the last big open green space and it should be a, a, um, an easy site to build a, a, a large train yard on because no one else lives there. It's kind of wasteland you know, to some people, I would suppose. Here are the, among some of the agencies that own or have facilities on the impact sites that occur um, on some of the plants. So these are directly impacted. Either they own the land or they have facilities, research facilities. Remember, these are research stations um, there. Uh, this one will be gone. Uh, this is just one of the many research stations. Um, but I wanna emphasize here, both the USDA, the Beltsville Ag Center and Patuxent Wildlife Research Center, also a refuge, are the largest research stations for both USDA and USGS. The largest ones in the nation are located here. They've been here for over a hundred years. Thousands of publications have come out about these areas. Um, there are over or approximately um, that I've been able to find, which many are so obscure, it's hard to find them. Um, species that have been described from the sites, i.e. the type locality is here or the types are located um, uh, f uh, were collected originally that describe the species from these grounds. Hundreds of um, biologists have lived and studied these areas. It is in almost any way you want to look at one of the best studies landscapes in the entire world. Great place for a train, industrial site. Um, so here are things that are going to be gone. This site, APA, long-term monitoring of air quality, gone. Uh, University of Maryland runs trials, gone. Um, here is the optical test site for NASA. This is immediately adjacent to um, one of the sites. Um, this area is so sensitive. I actually know someone who works there. Is so sensitive, they are, don't even allow um, electronic mice in the facility because they're dealing with um, satellite communications, lasers, and all kinds of you know, NASA sensitive things. Immediately adjacent, in fact, running through their land will be one of the train yards and they have protested this. There's, there's so many details to get, that I can't get into. They have protested this because what's the last thing you want? A um, uh, 200 acre train yard with lights. So it was chosen because it's the darkest area in the entire region. Lights, vibration, lots of electronic and like electrical communications. And um, so completely incompatible. It doesn't destroy the facility but it's right next to it. So it might as well destroy the facility. Um, so here, like, as I mentioned, um, what we're doing is taking your public lands. The, remember, this is the, this landscape is not someone's property. This is the public lands. There are, every one of you is a part owner of these lands. And many of you visit and use these landscapes for recreation or just knowing that they're there. Trips to the Native Plant Society, for example, um, they're giving it to a private corporation. This is, as far as we know, the only time that a private corporation would be on the receiving end of public lands in the region. I'm sure there's probably other examples elsewhere, but in the region, we don't give corporations um, public lands. We don't give them refuge land, for example. We don't give them built cell agricultural research station land. To, and particularly, we don't give them, well, that's a value judgment. We just don't give it to them. Um, and what's going to happen is we'll give them that land and everything alive, literally everything alive, will be eliminated. And plus there'll be a uh, surrounding circle of these sites of impacted areas, bringing in um, invasive plants and all the things you know that are created as a problem. How big, so you can look through these things. Um, it's big, right? So people don't, you know, 200 acres, hard to get your hand uh, you know, your hands around your quarter acre lot, for example, think you have a quarter acre lot, how many quarter acre lots could you put into 200 acres? And then all of a sudden you start, you can, by looking at this list, realize the scale of um, the kind of an impactful development. Again, this is another site in the background shot of that same train yard, the smaller train yard in China. And that's what we're asking for. Uh, one of the difficulties here 
is this is a would be was set a precedent, right? So we hand off a um, chunk of wildlife land and research station land in an area that has very little left to offer in terms of that wouldn't be expensive or wouldn't be complicated by lots of other people living in the area um, to a private corporation. So if you do that once, what's next, right? Oh, we need some space for a landfill. We need a water quality station. We need a sewage treatment plant. We need extra parking for commuters. We need more public recreational baseball diamonds. It doesn't really stop and we need more houses. All this could shift to private land. This is the kind of precedent that we can't afford just in terms of there would be no stopping. You are politically connected, you get what you want because it's already been done by maglev. So there's dangers beyond the immediate dangers of what would be lost. Okay, let's relax a little bit now and um, dial it into like what the biology is. So what you're looking at in the dark gray area is running near the fall line, but it's also the boundary. It also demarcates the early Cretaceous um, soils and landscapes that are exposed um, in the DC Washington area. This is important for several reasons, um, but a lot of this area way back when were basically a whole series of lagoons, deltas, swamps, and um, other kinds of wetland areas, maybe like Louisiana. And so what happened is the soils built out, you have, um, and uh, over the millennia, a lot of this wasn't really disturbed. There was some reconfiguring of those sediments, but what you have is um, a lot of clay lens, clay, um, clay soils overlain by sand, sand lenses, you know, from this combination of, of beach and wetland and other kinds of factors that we don't have a clear understanding. So why is that important? So that's important, first of all, uh, because it's not like any of the landscapes on either side. And you'll see a couple other reasons. Um, one of the uh, important things is that it, what is developed on this is this odd, odd, wonderful ecosystem that um, the sort of um, the highlight species, the poster child would be pitch pine. And Rod Simmons and um, John Parrish, among others, have highlighted this, Bill Harms up on Patuxent. Um, this ecosystem is globally rare. Again, we don't have time to get into a lot of the details. Um, it's um, the Nature Service has ranked it at uh, a very high level. It's the southernmost extent of what is essentially the Pine Barrens ecosystem. It's down here. This is the last remaining section of it. Uh, basically, it was also really crappy soil. So that's why a lot of times these landscapes end up in federal properties because they're crappy soil. No one wanted them as much. And there are just a bunch of poor people on them so they could kick them off. That's another story we're not going to get into. Anyway, I just want to highlight that it's filled with all kinds of really interesting plant communities that are highly specialized and only occur because of this kind of um, soil and ecosystem and landscape. And it's not a recreatable. We can't like go a few miles and find the same thing. It's special simply because of the existence of fairly large patches of this kind of ecosystem um, uh, of this pine barrens, basically. Uh, then there's different kinds of pine barrens and there's lots of bogs. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about those kinds of things. Very acidic system in lots of ways too. So um, as I mentioned, this is not a site that you can go somewhere else and replace. So once they're destroyed, that's it. It's not recreatable. Where are you going to get a sand lens on top of clay? You're not going to build that and you can't unbuild the maglev train site. Once the site has been prepped, you're going to put five feet of gravel and concrete on top of it, ruin all the hydrology of the area, and that's never coming back to this. So here what we're seeing on this side in particular, you're seeing some of the landscapes that are going to be removed, removed on the north tract of Patuxent um, as they widen they need lots of juice. They widen and shift some of the transmission lines out there. These are gone. Um, so more from the biology. Traditionally, a few sites, a few areas in Maryland trended or could be at least patchily barren lands, often um, maintained by, or in the early days when it was drier, just by fire and also dryness, but also by serpentine soils and in the Patuxent um, area right around here, it was um, because of um, Indian communities. So they lived along the river, lots of fish, fairly permanent um, communities and villages and towns. 
and they burned the heck out of everything because that was their tool. And they manipulated the environment, kept it very open. Um, on Patuxent, we're the only place left that can still support fires and fire communities and fire dominated vegetation, including the Pine Barrens, um, is a result of this kind of low level disturbance. So you can't um, go somewhere else and mitigate things and say, we're gonna have um, these uh, specialized systems. They just don't exist anywhere else. And that one of the beauties of their region is that we do support um, these kinds of management tools. Um, so I wanna point out another big picture thing here. So we could say, well, you know, there's X number of thousands of acres involved in this green triangle between Baltimore and Philadelphia. Why not lose a few? It's not that big of a deal. I think that's the MO of the Maglev group. It's not that much really. Um, but the problem is, is that um, the biodiversity of the region is supported by the interconnectedness of the landscape that remains. You have to have a large area that is connected by many, many factors with many different kinds of topographies and wetlands and soil types and disturbances so that you can still have an ebb and flow. Some areas are regrowing, some areas are cut down, some areas are burned, some are mature forests. You can't simply look at it as site by site, well, this site is not important. The importance is the unbrokenness of the landscape compared to everywhere else. So the biodiversity is supported by these things. This is the, um, the ecosystem of the maglev. So this is the appropriate place. This is where maglevs go and, um, and run their lives. Um, this is Baltimore Harbor. And you can see just interestingly, I had this slide already. There is a, this slide, I just wanted to show the inner harbor because we actually do studies down there. There are things, um, odd things that live in that environment because there's bits of green, not to go into that. But look at that, 184 acres available. Why isn't the maglev, which goes to Baltimore, putting it on that site? Um, you know, that is a good question. Baltimore and to lesser extent, Washington is the proper place for an industrial site. We have designed cities to fit the needs of an industrial nation. We have designed refuges and parks and research stations to uh, support nature and the study of nature and the study of wildness and, um, um, and to breathe for the community, right? Without these places, we, they filter our water, they produce oxygen for the air. Um, they give us a place to recreate, to, to recharge our batteries. Um, that is not where we go. We don't go to Baltimore Inner Harbor, as interesting as it may be to have any of those factors. We go to the research stations. Again, once it's gone, it's lost. It opens the door for lots more development. The biodiversity of these areas is driven by the plant communities, which as we'll see is incredibly rich and has I think about a third of all the species of plants known from Maryland occur just on the Patuxent Refuge, let alone the addition of the surrounding areas in bark. Um, so you have a lot of rarity. Each of those plants supports another entire universe, a small universe of unique Serengeti-like because they are endemic, right? You don't go to Serengeti to see the stuff that we have. Our place is just as magical and important as any other place in the world. Why are we mistreating it, right? Why is this not thought of as in the same way as some sort of sacred rainforest site. This is the last place, folks. You don't get it back. If you don't protect this, it's gone. It is as important as any chunk of rainforest. On this diversity, there are many, many other kinds of insects. There are uh, pathogens. There's unique chemicals. There's fungal communities. It supports another tiny world. You remove that species, you replace it with a, a something green. It's probably invasive does not support that kind of thing. This is our capacity to um, retain biological information for the entire world really is right here. Those special places have special things. You eliminate them, you don't got them anymore. Here is the appropriate place again for the maglev. Why are they not building at Sparrows Point, right? This is a great place, seemingly underused, has train ways, coal went one way, you can go back the other way. Great place to put the maglev. Why is it on a refuge? I have, I just, it just boggles my mind. 
um, why it is. Okay, let's go back here. So this is a map, a really interesting map, distribution of iron ore. So here's our, here's our similar early Cretaceous-like pattern there. And the interesting thing here is um, iron mines in the colonial times, this is where they all were, right? Because it was bog iron developed in these swampy environments that they could process using charcoal, which of course burned the entire region. The entire region by, in colonial days was also very open. Not just the Indians use a lot of fire. We charcoaled the heck out of it to support our industry, mostly iron production. And another interesting thing about iron production is it turns out that these mines were in a, um, an environment, which we don't have a whole lot of time, that um, in the 1800s um, was known as Dinosaur Alley. It was the only place east of the Mississippi that you could find dinosaur bones from the Cretaceous period. Here, for example, is one of the um, maglev sites is basically right here, which has known locations of dinosaur bones that were found within these regions. There's the dinosaur park. This right here where my arrow is going back and forth is one of the train yard locations. So it's an incredibly important um, and only in this area do you find these dinosaur bones. Um, and additionally, this is from what you're seeing here is a large tr dinosaur trackway found on NASA Goddard immediately adjacent to the location of another one of these proposed train yard sites um, with, um, you know, a variety of funky footprints um, that are, you know, were done by dinosaurs and early mammals. It's one of these fantastic finds. I urge you to go look that up because it's incredibly interesting to see both how they found it and also what else is there. Other kinds of tracks have been found um, in the region. We also, in just one trip, found uh, this jobber here, which we are claiming is a, a dinosaur footprint. It's the same strata, it's the same ironstone, rich sandstone that the um, ones you saw in the previous one were also located in. So we're gonna do that a little bit more, look for more of these kinds of fossil trackways. Again, you chew it up, you bury it, it's gone, that stuff's gone. Let's talk about sizes. Okay, here's Baltimore Washington Parkway. Uh, here are two different proposed routes. Um, if you look at the parkway, the roadbed, as you've traveled on this, you know what that, I'm talking about 40 feet wide, okay? Um, this, the trackway, remember there's two train tracks and a road down the middle because you have to access that 130 feet wide. And what's gonna happen here? Parkway, National Park Service, um, uh, and um, I'm pointing with my finger, that doesn't work. Um, and what you have, this area is going to be eliminated um, in terms of all trees and basically become an invasive alley. And then on either side, you have to trim the trees to so they don't fall onto the track and cause bad accidents. And now you've just fragmented this. This area between here and here has basically lost most of its biological value because it's no longer connected to anything. So that's just the train yards. Now, um, you can see this is the entrance from below ground um, because it comes up above ground into our parklands. Everything else is below ground, which has lots of other problems. You can look at Stop, Stop This Train website to find out all the societal problems of running through basically our blue collar neighborhoods for something that is going to be used by only people who have a lot of money. Um, so here it's coming out of the ground. It's going through either the city of Greenbelt, well, on either side here, and um, this is the uh, train tunnel stations. There's a uh, wetland right through there and stream system. Um, if we go further up, now we're up at the northern end, one of the proposed train yards. This is a 200 acre kind of thing going on. Here's 198. Here's Baltimore Washington Parkway. This is Patuxent Refuge. Here's the altered areas for transmission lines. They need a lot of juice, so we have substations. We also have over here, the Maya Angelou Academy and the Maryland Job Corps have their sites. Those are gonna be eliminated. Um, this is owned by the federal government with District of Columbia running it. You have Maryland City impacted uh, with the train going below ground here. And as you can see, the communities are not probably gonna be happy about the train running immediately underneath their houses. This is the Patuxent Refuge. Um, I don't know, oops, how did that happen? I don't know if you can see this because I'm seeing the corner of like our pictures up here in the thing, but um, it's not that big of a deal. This is the little Patuxent River here, and this is the big Patuxent. So somewhere in between, 
you have headwaters on either side. So a lot of this is just all small order streams, bogs, uh, all kinds of valuable um, natural habitats. And you can't see this well, I don't think, but the train yard actually literally goes into the river. I'm not sure what they're thinking. I don't even think you could do that, but um, it's actually running into the river system, which I just, it just boggles my mind. Like, could you do that? You'd have to divert the river. Um, this is some of that area. Thank you, um, Damien um, Ossie for providing these things. I have not visited this site, but it's on my list. There's the river. These are some of the bottom lands. So it's mostly wetlands at that edge along the river. It's extensive wetlands. These are all gonna be gone. Um, if we look at two more train yard proposed areas, we have one, I'm pointing with my finger again. This is the old airport area. This is um, airport bog. Um, this is all that type of, um, of uh, Pine Barrens areas that I've talked about. And you have trains skidding off of the trackways running through a lot of stations, a lot of areas being rediverted so that they can put in large power lines and other issues. Here's the NASA optical test site. This is a roadway that they're building into their parking lots um, going right through their property. We also have another train yard proposed here. Same thing. These, not same thing, but this is where the dinosaur areas um, are found. Um, this is where the trackways are found, by the way. This is dinosaur areas. Um, interesting stories there. But um, this one also has, um, uh, is all through the Pine Barrens, um, uh, Pitch Pine uh, Pine Barrens up here, and also is filled with um, seeps and bogs off to either side. It's running through all the headwater stream areas and will actually destroy the hydrology and the, and the bogs. And we care about these bogs because um, they're, they're one of the few, some are magnolia bogs, others are, um, uh, uh, there's all different kinds and I'm not a bogologist, so I can't give you the details. Rod and John have published on this as have others, including uh, like Nakatee a hundred years ago on some of these kinds of things. So here's um, one of the impacted areas. You can see the aerial, it's gonna run through here, down, join the parkway. This is APHIS, this is uh, USDA, this is Patuxent Refuge up here. This is all wetlands through here where they're going to put their landing ground. This is wetlands all through up here. And um, I could, I guess I have, I don't have that much time, so I wanna keep going. So in these areas where the um, sites are being proposed, you have these seeps, here, for example, you can see the sand that is part of this lens on top of the ground in this uprooted mass. You can see the sandy bottoms to these seeps and bogs and all the sphagnum associated with them. Here we have perhaps, um, Rod told me this is the rarest plant in Maryland. This is maybe the only known place that still has the small white fringed orchid. Um, it's, there's a longer list of rare plants We'll glance over that later. Um, that's part of that bog system. That bog system will disappear. Um, here is an example. This is the train yard that is nearby for the, um, uh, for the Greenbelt Metro station. Same thing, build a train yard. What's surrounding it? Nothing but Lespedeza. Like everything in this picture is an invasive. Foxtail, Lespedeza, um, your uh, pear trees and surrounded by honeysuckle. That's the additional buffer of pain that's going to go into these additional areas. Very briefly, let's talk about some of the plant and animal communities, at least in terms of numbers. They're well studied. So we actually have almost complete lists of some of these kinds of things. I won't have time to really, um, you can glance at this. This will be available afterwards so you can read some of this and um, some of these sites will have um, links to these lists. Um, 1,277 vascular plants just on uh, Patuxent. Thank you, Bill Harms another whole group um, from bark, which I don't have the values for. Birds, 282 species. Thank you, Marsha Wilson, for doing that. Um, we have um, a lot of rarity. The plants we've um, mentioned, lots of lots of obscure little grasses and sedges and those kinds of lovely things. But cerulean warbler, grasshopper sparrow, bobwhite, um, field sparrow, towhee, meadowlark. These are all the kinds of things that are now locally rare because we don't have these big open sites that we still maintain there. Um, these headwater streams, almost all are relatively clean. So you have things like glassy darter, um, a list of uh, like two different kinds of, um, or three different kinds of lampreys, 
Uh, lampreys are good sometimes uh, as indicators and they're not all evil. Um, and it's their well-studied um, sites um, in both Patuxent and on the Bark Center uh, where they do these um, periodic fish surveys. Reptiles and amphibians, some of the highlights, queen snake, mole king snake, um, spotted turtles, eastern spadefoot toad, upland chorus frogs, another pr pretty much the um, the absolutely no change in the species list from the from long ago. Bees, this is my thing. I love to spend all the time here talking to you about bee communities. There's a bunch of rare ones. No one knows, there are no common names that really make sense to people. But let me tell you, a lot of them are associated with rare plant communities, particularly the aracaceous ones. And they're also associated with the sand areas, the deep sand areas, particularly on the Anne Arundel side of uh, the, um, of the uh, refuge on the other side of um, the Patuxent River, the big Patuxent. Rare Tenebriana uh, beetles, same thing. Um, Warren Steiner has looked at these uh, associated with sand. A lot of them are wingless. They're not gonna re uh, sh show back up if you get rid of them. Um, 112 species just of odonates. So da uh, damselflies and dragonflies studied by Richard Orr. Um, and this is the largest list of any national park or refuge in the entire United States is right here at Patuxent because we have and maintain a diversity of streams and wetland habitats, including state and um, nationally endangered species. 84 butterflies, 264 moths, you know, and counting on those. Um, these are just some of these sand community plants that are maintained there that have associated, I know the bees have bees that are only go to these individual plants, not the grasses of course, but it gives you an idea of prairie elements that still are retained here and still are maintained because of the management activities on both of these sites. Um, lots of rarity. I'm winding down now. What I want you to know is that I have spent the last um, few weeks gathering different species that you're just seeing here that I'm not gonna give you the names of, of all the tiny micro communities of uh, insects and arthropods that live on these sites that will be gone. Not, none of these will exist after this site is eliminated. And it's just incredible, the diversity of these tiny things that we don't spend enough time looking at and honoring and realizing that most of the diversity of earth is the size of, you know, the head of a pin. And um, this is the kind of thing that um, we should be thinking hard about in terms of uh, retaining because we have that opportunity, but you can't unretain it once you can't undo the maglev afterwards. Um, so uh, just a few more, this is one of my piglet plant hopper who even knew that existed. Um, so, um, I'm making arguments here that um, really are common sense. It doesn't make any sense to put in the maglev site here if you have any concern whatsoever for the environment. Um, and uh, it's only going to um, get worse. So um, the Federal Railroad Administration and Maryland Department of Transportation are the groups that um, write the reports. So um, they have been given $30 million to do an EIS of the area and to do studies. And uh, it'll be very interesting to look at their drafts coming up to see how much of this kind of information we've talked about here moved into their reports and become a consideration factor. Um, so remember they're doing the EIS for the entire run of the uh, train between Baltimore and Washington. So in, interestingly, there was a final report. There is some very marginal public um, input at times in the first, um, first phase of the project where you could go and kind of talk to somebody. But in their final report, the FRA and, and uh, they, there's this quote, FRA and MDOT subsequently dropped the BARC RSD option, that's the train yard, from further consideration. The BARC RSD option will not be included uh, as a component of the DIS, Draft Environmental Impact Statement. But a lot of shady things going on here because uh, that would have only left the 198 site. And um, so in between, without telling anyone, because they have uh, these uh, notifications for like how we will communicate with you, um, they put back one and back the other, but told no one except for some of the agencies. They had a couple of eyes only agency meetings like, oh yeah, we know what we, we reconsidered. Um, but that was not announced to the public. A lot of this is like people have no idea the maglev exists. 
And when they think about the maglev, it's all through the filter of what has been said by the maglev corporation and the uh, notion that the people who um, they are giving quite a bit of money to, for example, they're the fifth largest um, lobbying group within uh, of the state of Maryland alone legislature. So um, there's stuff going on folks and it's not about saving the biology of this area. So that's all I have. I wanted to leave some time. I don't know how much time I took up there because I'm not looking at a watch, but I do want to thank all the, uh, all my biological predecessors and all their field reports and all their years of investigations and all the biology that they published in super obscure publications where they only talk to each other. The thousands of observers, amateur and otherwise, who are currently um, involved and have been involved over the time, a set of people who provided some information um, for the uh, technical part of this uh, reports and published on the uh, biodiversity area. You can see, I hope, uh, my um, email address there that you can communicate with me. Um, there's two websites to um, look at if you want to uh, get into some of the details about how you might be able to help um, uh, deal with the, some of the issues and, and text, uh, gives you uh, a way to make comments and to find out like, how do I, how do I work in, in this kind of system? So um, uh, www.stopthistrain.org is uh, an amalgamation of lots of different groups who are working on this. Um, mostly not biologists, right? Mostly it's actually um, uh, people have to do with, let's just say environmental justice and local communities. That's their orientation. They also are in need of people who are biologically aware. And then there's a Facebook group that you could also look up. And I'm gonna stop there. So, Ann or um, Lynn, are there any questions? Yes, there are many questions. And before we get into the questions, I just want to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be available in about two weeks uh, on the Maryland Native Plant Society YouTube channel and also on our MNPS Facebook page, both places. Before we get into the many specific questions, Sam, several people have asked, is this a done deal or is it only proposed? And they also have asked, how can they help? How can they lobby? You have referenced the two websites on your last slide, but is there Anything else you'd like to say about how all these people who want to help can do so? Right, so upcoming will be um, writing um, statements to, to the group that does the environmental impact statement, because that's where we are right now. Um, and so if you have information that you wanna share, particularly you'll have to look at what the draft environmental impact statement is. And then they have only a 45 day window where comments can be made. Theoretically, that's coming out in the Christmas holidays. How inconvenient for everybody. Um, and also they've rushed that. So my expectation is that there's gonna be a lot of holes. They're, I think, essentially trying to do this before the current administration um, uh, moves off the deciding platform. Um, there's also what would be a political component, right? So in order to transfer these lands, my understanding, not that great, is that these um, lands, the, the transfers are gonna be have to be signed off by Congress. Um, and I, that's uh, all I know. I think there may be more on these uh, websites. So that means you should be in touch with your um, local, um, uh, you know, Congress people and other um, local to um, national political figures, your representatives of the, your public land. You can tell them that you've heard about this, you've learned something, write it in your own words. My brother works um, at the White House in the correspondence office, and he says that um, people, people, the most impactful thing to do is write your own letter. So you don't want to do form letters or anything else. Mostly those are just compiled into um, a big pile. So these are impacts that you can do it by writing a simple short note saying that you're opposed to this, the Stop Maglev people say that you should be completely opposed to it. There's been no alternatives other than putting the, um, the train yards on these public lands. So there's no like, oh, well, well, what about the Baltimore site? 
it doesn't exist, right? They didn't, have, they didn't even consider that um, during the proposals. The Railroad Administration and Maryland Department of Transportation did not put that in together. So don't know why, but you have a voice, so you should use it. Okay, a related question. Do you know which of the agencies will be receiving the draft environmental impact statement for review and comment? The questioner understands that it's those whose land would be directly affected. Yeah, it's interesting. And one of the reasons I'm here today is that they forgot that the US Geological Survey's um, research station is Patuxent Wildlife Research Refuge which they're involved, the Beltsville Ag Center, USDA is involved. Um, I know the people at the Fish and Wildlife Service, they are actively pushing back. I don't really have a understanding of what's going on within USDA. And then those other agencies are also actively involved. So they also, um, you know, you can't, what's um, maybe out, I have not heard word, is a draft administrative impact statement that the um, various involved landowner uh, agencies have to make comments on, then the um, draft environmental impact, public draft environmental impact statement will come out, like as I mentioned in December. Um, and this is all happening very quickly um, at that point. I have not, e I've been trying to find out whether the um, administrative Im impact statement is out but I haven't been able to find that out. Um, in general, my impression is that um, these agencies can't share that widely or at all. I'm not sure why, and I'm not sure if uh, what the rationale is behind that, but that's where things stand right now. There's a lot of agencies and I don't, I haven't cross-referenced everything, but I think other than us, um, that pretty much everybody um, is in on that um, evaluation. The questioner actually uh, asked about the administrative draft EIS, yeah. which she understood was for review and comment in November. And she has just typed that the general draft environmental impact statement will be issued in January, 2021. Okay, good. Um, uh, okay, well, November is different. I was hearing October, but November uh, for the administrative one um, makes sense. Again, I'm not, I'm very focused on just this sort of fact gathering and applying and supplying information that I think is going to be missed by most of the other groups. Um, so, okay, I, I would go with their um, understanding. The next question is about the optical test site. Is it owned by NOAA or NASA? And the questioner says that NASA GSFC occupies the land adjacent to Bark. Yeah, it's, did I say Noah? It's uh, NASA. It's a, a NASA Goddard uh, facility. And if, right, NASA Goddard is immediately adjacent to Bark. Um, and you have addressed this some, but another person wants to know what alternative locations were considered. And a related question is how many acres in the old stadium in DC could that be used? Um, so, um, so there's a process that goes back several years when maglev was just being talked about and they had these open discussions and um, there was an initial sighting that had the train line, instead of going up uh, Baltimore Washington Parkway, it was going up the existing um, train lines. Um, and um, so, um, so right up the, 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 the Amtrak and the, um, the freight, freight lines that currently exist, um, they would put in additional lines along those. I'm not sure why those were no longer considered to be viable, uh, but those disappeared. The train yards initially during that phase were still going to be at least on the Beltsville Ag Center. Um, that one was removed and then secretly put back on. Um, and then the 198 one was there for the Baltimore Washington corridor. So we have eliminated, and I don't know that they ever um, considered putting in a train yard in Baltimore. I'm not sure why. Again, it's, it's the natural place for an industrial yard. And 
it's not just holding a bunch of trains. It's also where they're manufacturing trains. It's a factory. It's also a cleaning repair uh, place. All that wash water, for example, from cleaning the trains and just the runoff of uh, these areas, all the pollutants that are going to be deposited there by all this um, work are going right into those headwater streams. So pretty much everything from there down is going to be impacted. It's like the worst possible place to put it. A related question is whether it's too late to lobby to change to the Baltimore Harbor site. And I gather the answer is no, it's not too late. I don't, you know, I don't know the, um, the answer that completely. So it's not too late to stop it. Um, the um, FRA, the Federal Railroad Administration and Maryland Department of Transportation has had a number of years to play around with the notion of putting it in Baltimore. Why that has not, and maybe I'm just not, uh, not aware of the history, why it's not, uh, we're not seeing any proposed train yards in Baltimore, I don't really know. Um, again, remember, it's not biologists who are running the show here, it's engineers. So they're looking at this and going like, perfect place, halfway between, it's a lot of open land, you know, uh, no, we won't inconvenience any private landowners or piss them off. Um, who might be politically connected. I don't really know. Somewhere they have the notion that they can walk in and take our public lands. It's taking, it's a taking exercise. Why this corporation feels like they can do that is a mystery. Next question is, I thought this train was supposed to run underground. It does, except to come up and they, they need a place to store their trains to wash them, to manufacture them and all that kind of stuff. That the only place that it's running above ground is right on our public lands. So they come up and then they go back down. So they come up at Greenbelt, they go down to Maryland City, impacting highly in a lot of expectation ways, Greenbelt and uh, Maryland City because it's running through their parks and then it's going to be immediately running through underneath their neighborhoods. Another audience member asks, are there any historical records of Atlantic white cedar swamps? And if so, were they logged out? I'm not aware of any. I don't think, I'm going to say I don't think so. Um, there are One's, of course, on the Eastern shore, but I'm not aware of any in the Patuxent uh, belts are. If someone knows, if, you know, Rod or John or Bill are on this thing, you can throw a message in there. Okay, we'll watch for it. Um, another audience member worked at Bark about 25 years ago and was told that there were brook trout in the little paint branch. Is that still the case? Uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one. Maybe someone else does too. Which public officials other than Governor Hogan are supporting this project? Uh, I, I, this, I'm not the right person to ask. My impression from being on the websites and being on some Zoom calls and some joint um, operations things is that almost all the local politicians are um, in favor of the no maglev approach. Um, Again, you think about it, the only places that you can get on this train would be in the middle of Washington, in the middle of Baltimore, and there's one stop at the BW airport. It runs through all the communities in, you know, again, seemingly very selectively blue collar ones um, running between Baltimore and Washington and PG and Anne Arundel County, but no, it has no benefit. First of all, you probably can't even afford a ticket. Like I can't afford a ticket on there. They haven't put out their prices, but it's not going to be something that you would use. And plus you'd have to go to DC to go to Baltimore, right? It makes no sense. And the, the anti-maglev groups do a, a really good job, I think, of sort of debunking the environmental benefits that are, are proposed by the maglev corporation from a, you know, air pollution and traffic reduction um, sort of way, and also debunk a lot of the um, time savings that um, the communities would get by traveling on basically what is uh, like a, a Disney ride um, kind of train operation. It really loses a lot of its luster as something that is 
uh, needed within the environment. Um, we have uh, the Acela, for example, and we have other fast trains um, that are being proposed and could be built in the same um, sites uh, that currently have railroad tracks. Again, in an environment that we have built to accommodate the human ecosystem, the human industrial ecosystem, without um, you know running it all over the place on our public lands. And our last site, this is it. This is the last place that we have uh, left to protect. You know, it ratchets one way. You can't unprotect. It's not like we're gonna bulldoze some subdivisions to replace what was lost. We wouldn't want them anyway. Um, going back to a previous question, Bill Harms and Sandy Spencer have posted in the chat that there is no Atlantic white cedar on the refuge. Uh, someone else is posting that there were some white cedar swamps in Anne Arundel County. Um, okay, next question is how many currently threatened or endangered plants have been recorded in the area? Are there current or past locations with pine barren rarities like pine barrens, gentian, bog asphodel, or swamp pink? Yeah, I'm not the, again, I'm not the best person to ask. There are several, but I don't have the exact list. Um, and um, uh, so I, I can't, I can't say what, what that is. Can you speak at all about the effect of underground tunneling at the Anacostia and Quincy Run end of the proposed project? Also, four ventilation stations will be part of the built environment, e.g. near Bladensburg Waterfront Park. Yeah, that's a good point and not, not something I'm concentrating on, uh, local boy to the Beltsville Ag Center that I am. Um, but they um, under, so if you're going to build underground, you have to have to, have to do several things. You have to have a, a place to put all your equipment. You have to have air and exit tunnels throughout. And you have to have um, a place to put all that dirt. Um, there's also, so there's a lot of questions surrounding that about how that works um, and some semi-crazy schemes that I saw about, um, you know, filling in the bay with, you know, to make marsh from this stuff. And um, uh, also the local communities are extremely concerned because of the vibration, the foundation, um, shaking, the noise aspects, and the loss of um, property value for something that doesn't support them. Uh, but you would need to go to the website and to the Facebook group to learn more about those kinds of things. And um, so, but yes, it's uh, an important point that there are a lot of above ground impacts to the underground development of the remainder of the track. What is the status of the money allocated by Congress for the upgrade of the pen line? The questioner is wondering how much of an alternative that could be to the maglev. Yeah, I don't know um, that the answer to that. The um, proposed uh, funding mechanism, from what I know, is similar to what the purple line um, uh, situation and the Beltsville extension situation is, which is a, a public-private partnership. Um, which, uh, again, I have a weak understanding, but my uh, understanding is um, that the Maglev Corporation has made no um, commitment to, uh, uh, to any financial loss if things don't work out. In other words, the public would be on the hook for um, picking up the, the check if the Maglev Corporation decides that it's too expensive for them or something like that. A lot of these, the money for the project is being funded by um, uh, the uh, a, a series of Japanese businesses um, as a, a venture. And um, uh, despite the fact that it's a, a US corporation, a lot of the funding is coming from overseas. And um, again, we don't have, uh, there's, there's things that should be looked at, let's just say. Someone would like to know what the acronym MAGLEV stands for. Magnetic levitation, just a shortcut thing, because um, the, yeah, it's riding on a cushion of, of magnets, really. And there, it takes a, a large amount of juice, which sort of, you know, goes against the fact that you're saving the environment um, to run that. And it requires 
a great buildup of the electrical infrastructure, which again has to go somewhere. Um, so we're just talking about some of the impacts. So a lot of other impacts are power stations, places uh, that you have to put down your equipment and, um, and upgrades to our um, electrical system in the area. Uh, next, we have several comments that are not questions, um, but I'll relay them. The Prince George's County Council and the Greenbelt City Council are on record in opposition to the maglev. And another attendee says, shouldn't we just opt to stop the whole project, not just the train yard? Sounds like another purple line. Yeah, so I think that's the argument of most of the people who oppose the, um, uh, who have problems with the, the uh, maglev thing is they want, th their alternative is no maglev whatsoever. Um, they make arguments that particularly with COVID and people staying at home and the fact that um, it may be public transportation and public just means that anyone can, who has a lot of money can ride it, but you're really financing a system. The public is financing a system uh, with public funds to uh, support basically the very, very wealthy for a um, transportation um, mechanism that's not really that necessary. And that if you were to put the funds that would be going into and already have um, into the system into upgrading public transportation that supports the local communities and the average person, that would be money much better spent. So I, that's my opinion. Next question is, could anyone broach this with DOD, the Department of Defense and Fort Meade? It would appear that they have some interest in this. Um, I'm not sure. Um, there's a couple really interesting, weird uh, defense installations near one of the train yards, uh, CIA and another DOD communication site, uh, you know, like fi can't figure out what they do. Um, so they're, um, uh, yeah, there's a number of uh, Defense Secret Service has a facility right there too. They're involved in um, on these calls, the administration calls, um, and so they were, are going to be involved in the administrative review of the documents too. But how how they could be impacted, I'm not really. Again, I'm not clear. Uh Someone would like to know whether there has been any discussion or plans for wildlife crossings to be constructed along the train line, like those similar to highway crossings out west. I'm not sure that applies if it's underground, but do you want to address that, Sam? Yeah, so um, most of the time that it's above ground, not all the time, obviously it has to come out of the ground. And um, interestingly, the current proposal is that when they come out of the ground, they will be in deep slots. Okay, so there actually will be, the problem could be deer jumping into the um, slots. Um, but at some point, they, they call them viaducts. Right? You know, they're elevated train yards. So these lines will be elevated above and things can go, you know, merrily um, underneath. But um, so I don't think the wildlife crossing thing is at much of an issue. Now that we know maglev ridership has plummeted in Japan as work from home and COVID have disrupted normal work habits, is it possible they could shelve the entire idea? Well, that's certainly being pushed and that, that, that just that notion that we don't really need this, that things have changed since they started and maybe the, they, sh Maybe they were always like that, um, that this doesn't, this is a, a train that um, goes nowhere. Okay, next we have um, a comment from Susan McCutcheon from our stopthistrain.org website. The project sponsor has changed some of the NEPA scheduling for the SC Maglev. Cooperating agencies have been notified of changes to the schedule, the administrative DEIS draft environmental impact statement will now be provided to agencies on October 19th, 2020, instead of December 28th, 2020, 
Comments from agencies are due on November 13th, 2020. The DEIS will be out for public comment January 22nd, 2021. Right, Susan knows. So I, I think you can trust that that schedule is correct. Uh, the next no, one. I've not seen the administrative one. I wish I could get a copy. If anyone has a copy, send it to me, please. Okay, would the government be just giving the land to the developer? If so, isn't that a reason that the options you mentioned aren't being considered? Wouldn't Maglev have to pay for land other than government land? Uh, the, the answer is probably. I don't know if they're going to be gifted this. I kind of think that 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 really doesn't make sense, but I don't know how, I don't know how the financial transactions are going to run. They certainly aren't gonna to go to Patuxent or to Deltzel Ag Center if they sell that land um, to the Maglev Corporation. Maybe there won't be any sale whatsoever because it'll be deemed, you know, so important to the public good. But again, look at, look at their actions in terms of like how they're interacting with people, what kind of bill of sale, uh, the Maglab Corporation is selling people and how much money they're lobbying um, our politicians. You know, your and my politicians are getting hit by a lot of information from the Maglev Corporation and the Maglev Corporation is not giving us a whole lot of information, nor is it telling us and the uh, people who are running the evaluations, the transportation um, groups um, giving us much information about what is going on with them too. It's been a very um, damped down um, approach, like no information is good information unless you're a politician apparently. Uh, someone would like to know whether the Lemons Bridge Pitch Pine Wetland, which has the state champion pitch pine in the middle of it, would be affected. Um, at the, on, so, it, it could have been in the previous run. So when they were running the um, line or proposing that the line run up the current train corridor, they were going to take, because apparently they have to have a very straight run, they were going to run into that area. Um, that currently is not um, uh, on any of these, um, unless they've changed again, uh, is not currently on any of the schedules. What about birds that use magnetic fields in migration? How would they be affected by maglev? Good question. I have no idea. Um, we have a comment from Sandy Spencer, who is involved in, uh, she's a refuge biologist involved in the review of the DEIS. And she says she can answer the question about done deal. Would you like me to try to unmute her? Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, hi, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to uh, allay everyone's fears that no, this is by no means a done deal. Um, my agency, US Fish and Wildlife Service, which owns the Patuxent Research Refuge, um, and other agencies, land-based agencies that are affected are taking a really, really hard look at this proposed maglev and its route. And um, besides the impacts to uh, flora and fauna and natural resources, there are a lot of other legal hurdles that they're gonna have to overcome especially uh, with respect to land transfer. So no, it's far from a done deal. And uh, right now we're in this uh, draft EIS review stage. And then soon the public one will come out. So that's where you need to roll up your sleeves and get ready because it is massive. Um, but um, it's, it's not going to be... Um, they're trying to push it through quickly, but it's not going to be easy for them to solve many of the questions and problems that this um, something of this scale is they're going to have to overcome. So um, 
there, there you have it. Well, they, uh, my understanding of these environmental impact things is, and Sandy, you can disabuse me of this, is that <laughs> the agencies and the public can bring up things that they felt were not addressed. And as long as it's done in a, you know, uh, let's call it a formal and reasoned way with a lot of justification, the um, people who drafted the EAS have to go back and answer those questions. And sometimes it's gonna be technical things like, what about the hydrology? What about the drainage? Mm -hmm. You forgot to address these kinds of issues, you know, and they'll have to go back. Sandy, is that your understanding? Um, those kinds of questions are already being asked and those kinds of questions are already being discussed in the draft EIS, um, but probably not to everyone's satisfaction. So there's, like I say, there's gonna be any number of stumbling points that um, will trip this project up along the way. Yeah, so we're, it's, a, it's a package deal. There's a lot of outside groups who are going to be inspecting this in terms of communities and they're gonna have responses and questions and they're going to submit them to the environmental impact statement review people, whatever that's called. Um, and those are gonna have to be addressed um, appropriately um, in the um, final environmental impact statement. And then, you know, following that, um, someone, there will have to be decisions made. And this is where I think uh, alerting your appropriate political representatives of your concerns, um, pro or con, um, is important now because at some point they probably will have to be involved and will be making decisions because it's not um, something that um, the Maglev Corporation can do without um, approval by uh, maybe not so much agencies, but at least by the um, by Congress. Right, because you know this is public land. You can't just transfer land. Uh, to a private organization, just like that, it does. It would take an act of Congress, and um, National Park Service and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service also have to determine whether or not uh, we think this is compatible. Uh, or um, the National Park Service has their own term, but um, like I said, there are a lot of legal hurdles that um, will have to be overcome, and it's not going to be easy for them. Right. Let alone. Yeah. Yeah. So it's we have great people like Sandy in the regional offices, and, and the notion of you know they often will try and put together a mitigation package. But how do you mitigate the kinds of environments that are so specialized that they only exist in those areas that you want to destroy becomes difficult. But um, you know the bottom line is they still can do whatever they want. Um, under nor normal circumstances, um, except that the political, um, the let's call it the political universe can tell them no based on the information from the environmental impact statement. There's no teeth, in other words, in the impact statement itself, but the community and their representatives have that teeth. Uh, there is another comment uh, related to this from Susan McCutcheon in the chat. Elected officials are being promised that the project will bring jobs, jobs, jobs. The NAACP and the Chambers of Commerce from Anne Arundel County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, and Prince George's have expressed support before seeing the DEIS based on that premise. Uh, I also want to uh, say that Karen Molinas has asked in the chat if there are any volunteers who would be willing to help the Maryland Native Plant Society prepare comments for the draft environmental impact statement. So if you'd like to help with that or send it to fieldtrips at mdflora.org. Let me just say that that is important. Um, in addition to um, valuable insights that the Maryland Native Plant Society would have that maybe agency people like Sandy and myself may not have. Um, it's also uh, shows that there's outside community interest in these problems. Um, and it's not just a bunch of, you know, career biologists who are complaining and can be dismissed later. Um, 
Additionally, that those kinds of comments would be passed over to your, um, you know, the appropriate political representatives too, so that they also know that this is not just an insular issue. It's something that has um, community impacts and that people are going to complain about. So I want to thank you, Sam, for a great presentation on this really important topic and for fielding all of those questions. Well, I, I, can, I have given hundreds of talks and I consider this to be the most consequential. Thank you guys for hosting this and putting it up. I think that's important because these, these are obscure to most people issues. But I think once they know about them, they'll find it um, compelling and important. And we could use some media on it too. How about that? Good night.